You're here to learn how Palantir can help make you rich, and also how seeking Alpha's mediocre research can contribute to that going forward. So if you've been in stocks for anything more than a few months, you're probably already aware of the fact that the media and different investing websites and stuff typically aren't always pure hearted in their motivation for sharing certain types of information or wording certain things in a certain way. Recently, I made a video, click up here if you wanna check it out, where I talked about the whole silver thing that appeared all of a sudden um, during the GameStop drama kind of a couple months ago. Basically, everybody was buying GameStop and Citadel and a bunch of these big hedge funds were getting screwed. And all of a sudden, everywhere you looked, it was like, silver is amazing. It's the best investment ever. You should get silver. And then obviously you look into it and you find out that Citadel has huge holdings in silver. And so they're very motivated to get you to buy silver. And a lot of the media outlets were even saying, Redditors are now turning to silver. And you're like, I'm on Reddit, I'm like, dude, nobody's even talking about silver. What is this kind of thing? So a lot of that junk happens in the media and also on financial websites. Another media blitz I often refer to a couple of years ago is Tesla, when Tesla was starting to really show their teeth and show that maybe they will start to change the world. Maybe they will accomplish Musk's goal of making the world shift away from gas and fossil fuels over to electric vehicles. There was this huge media push talking about like, Tesla's about to go out of business, Tesla's about to run out of money, their cars suck, everything is garbage, and don't worry about them, they're not even a big player kind of thing. And sure enough, zoom forward to now, and like the whole auto industry is in a panic. They're in a tizzy, actually, to try and get electric cars out on the road as fast as possible. And it all makes sense when you look at the media company's biggest clients who send them millions of dollars a year to run commercials for them are the traditional automakers who don't have electric cars. So a lot of what happens in the media and a lot of what you're fed in the media isn't always the most helpful and the most purely motivated. So we need to take everything that they say with a grain of salt. And in this article in particular by Seeking Alpha, the fourth point in their article summary, check it out here, is looking for a helping hand in the market? Members of Best Short Ideas get exclusive ideas and guidance to navigate any climate. So it's like, they're a business. They're trying to get your money. They're trying to get your clicks. That's why clickbait is a thing. So in this Seeking Alpha article, the title of it, they're basically declaring nothing is valuable about Palantir. There's nothing attractive about this stock. There are zero good benefits to this stock, basically is what it's saying. I mean, there's clickbait, and then there's just outright blatant lies. That's kind of like saying... Pizza potatoes aren't super mouthwateringly delicious. It's like, what are you thinking? That, like, who thinks that? <sighs> so I wanted to take a minute and address uh, these complaints that they brought up in the article and share some of the facts that reboot, rebut, rebuttal, re what's the word? Re rebut, rebut, I don't, I don't know. So I wanted to take a look at the article and look at some of the complaints they brought against Palantir and share some of the facts that refute those. Just for clarity first though, I own Palantir stocks. I like the stock, I'm in it for the long term, but it is certainly not the easiest stock to give a fair value to. Nobody knows how to do that. And with all things disruptive, it's really, really hard to put a value on them. And also uh, the leadership of the company have made it really clear that this is not the company you wanna be day trading or swing trading. It's not gonna make you rich like right now. They're like, dude, forget about it. Just be in it for three or five years and then you'll start to see it take off. So the first point they brought up is that Palantir only has 125 customers despite being in business for nearly two decades. And as a result, it's not diversified enough. What's the definition of diversified enough? Like I can name numerous companies who only have one or two clients who've been in business for generations and make millions of dollars. Think of any defense contractor, their client is the US military or the Air Force or something like that. You can't just be like, that entire business is stupid because they're not diversified enough. It's kind of like a doctor saying like, oh, you weigh 100 pounds, that's too much, you're unhealthy. And it's like, yeah, if you're like a toddler, then that's a big deal. But if you're any kind of adult, that's, you know, doesn't really apply and it's too broad, it's too vague to actually be helpful or informative. So saying that they only have this many clients and therefore they're in trouble, kind of doesn't really get the idea of how Palantir might be working. And it actually kind of comes off like you don't know anything about how companies work in general too. Palantir has actually already addressed uh, these concerns in their most recent investor presentation. 
Um, there were also a lot of concerns saying that they're too government centric. They don't have enough retail traction yet. But in fact, last year, 44% of the revenues came from the commercial sector. Um, but going back to uh, Seeking Alpha's criticism that they don't have enough clients, they just announced the IBM and the Amazon deals, which I've talked about in this video up here. And when you're looking at something like the Amazon Web Service deal, where there's like millions of clients on Amazon Web Service, and they can just kind of click and plug in Palantir stuff to start learning how to analyze data and start making really helpful decisions for the company going forward. Like you could look at it as like Amazon is one customer, but actually like Shopify or something like that. Um, if you offered a plugin on Shopify, you could say Shopify is your client, or you could also say you have 20,000 users within Shopify. Um, I think we're gonna start to see these numbers scaling up very much into the future. And that brings us to the next criticism. It says, due to its narrow product market fit, it will be hard for Palantir to scale its business. I completely disagree. And they've shown really clearly already that they work in various different arenas, various different industries. And the Amazon argument I was just talking about is proof that it's not just like, we only work in this type of market. I think that shows that the author doesn't really know that much about Palantir. Here's a shot from the investor presentation talking about in 2020, we helped 100 commercial organizations and 10 national governments respond to COVID-19. And they show kind of like a big respond to COVID-19 type of overlay for like a pretty slide kind of thing. But the way you work with every single company is going to be very different depending on their size, their complexity, which country they're in, and all these different kinds of things. So just saying Palantir only works with one type of company or Palantir has a very specific market fit, um, I feel like is a little bit naive. Um, they've also mentioned that they work with metal producers, power and energy companies, as well as health insurance and networks. Those are all very different types of companies. It is true that Palantir isn't always like ultra super blindingly fast quick to be able to provide huge value for all of their clients. But I think the reason the US military and so many different governments around the world continue to work with them and re-sign their contracts with them proves that Palantir is not only trustworthy, but they can get the job done and they can do it really well and provide really deep insights. Here's another slide where they talk about how they expanded work with a Fortune 200 company and enabled a key transformation of their order fulfillment system in under two weeks. And that shows that they can provide value really, really quickly, um, but it also shows that scaling isn't actually that insane for them. Getting a big project off, off its feet in two weeks shows some, that's some good signs, you know what I mean? Moving on, they mention, despite the recent growth, we see several risks that will prevent Palantir from growing further. That's, is the author really saying Palantir can no longer grow? Or does he just not understand the difference between a company growing and a stock price growing? Like he's just conflating these two straight up. And if you were like a beginner investor or not like awesome at reading or whatever, you might just look at this and be like, oh man, Palantir's not gonna grow anymore. But again, this shows that the author doesn't really know what he's talking about. You know, use the IBM and Amazon examples I just talked about. The author goes on to say, while the company improved its revenues in quarter four by 40% year over year, the company still failed to make a profit as its gap EPS was negative eight cents. In addition, one of the biggest downsides of Palantir is its small client base, which we've already addressed. The company only has 125 customers. I already addressed that. Okay. There are two struggles that every company has when they first go public. Number one is paying for going public. Um, there are a bunch of different ways you can go public. You can do a direct listing or you can do it through like an investment bank, but there are fees associated with that. And generally speaking, when a company goes public for that year, they're figuring out how to pay for all that stuff and it costs a lot of money. In Palantir's case, I think it was about 847 million bucks. So when you factor that in, yeah, their EPS isn't gonna look super great the first year. And the second thing most companies have to deal with when they first go public is stock-based compensation. So when people work in your company, you want to, if you care about them, you want to reward them and you wanna say, hey buddy, thanks for doing a good job. Here's a bunch of free stock. And once the lockup period is done, you can sell it and make a bunch of money, you know? And every company that cares about their employees does this. And the interesting thing about Palantir is that it's actually been functioning for like a long time, like many, many years. And so a lot of these people have probably been waiting around dude, I can't wait to get stock, dude, I can't wait to cash out. 
And then when they finally went public, they could do that. And they show here in the investor presentation, over the quarters, the stock-based compensation associated with all of that. So in 2020, it was $1.2 billion. So yeah, you can nitpick on Palantir and say it has nothing of value to contribute to the world. Um, but actually, these are two things that pretty much every company has to deal with when they go public. Next, the author goes on to say, since Palantir doesn't make any profits and doesn't generate a positive free cash flow, there's a risk that the company will be diluting its shareholders in the future in order to continue to fund its growth and improve its top line performance. In addition, by trading at a price to sales ratio of over 30 times and a market cap of nearly 50 billion, we believe that Palantir is significantly overvalued and its future growth is more than priced in already. Yes, and, I, and again, as I mentioned at the beginning, like figuring out a fair value for a company like this is really tricky. If you compare it to other IPOs like Snowflake, it looks stupidly cheap actually um, for the amount of growth and for the PS and all that stuff. Yeah, you can also take a look at the free cash flow and say, oh my gosh, this is a red alert. Or you could look at companies like Amazon who were like not profitable for the longest time and now they like run the world of retail. So picking on a company and saying they don't, they're not super profitable in their first year, therefore it sucks or therefore it has no value is kind of like short-sighted, I think. And again, Palantir leadership is always saying, please invest for the long term, guys. That leads me into the next complaint that they make. On top of that, less than a month ago, Palantir executives began to unwind their positions in the company after the lockup period expired. Considering all of those events, it's hard to justify a long position in Palantir since its management doesn't inspire confidence regarding the company's long term future. It is true that I think a lot of the management like really like money. Um, but let's take a look at the actual holdings of the management. Um, when there's insider trading, when somebody who is high up in the company or owns a large portion of the company, um, if they're buying or selling, they need to file that with the SEC, which becomes public information. And so we can check it out on the internet. Check it out here, we have Alex Karp, everybody's favorite mad scientist down there at the bottom. It shows that he still has, second column from the right, more than 6 million shares. Yeah, he traded 1.2 something million shares, but he still has a large percentage of them. Same goes for a lot of the other directors on here. Uh, it shows Peter Thiel here getting 20 million shares and having it no more shares actually on that chart, which is cause for alarm. But one of the one of the tricky things when you're looking at these listings is that there are direct and there are also indirect transactions going on. And so direct would be like, this is the company giving it to me. Indirect is like, this is the company giving it to my fund or um, some kind of organization that I'm connected with. And Peter, and in Peter Thiel's case, he has three investment groups that he is involved with running, um, and he's already a multi-billionaire. Um, it seems from what we see in the media recently that he's still quite on board and still quite in love with Palantir. Uh, what do you guys think about this? Is, does this feel like a red alert or something like that? Going back to their argument, it's not like, all of the management of the company just sold out of everything and bounced. Um, and I think it's fair for a lot of these people, they've probably been working at Palantir for 10 plus years. I think it's fair for them to cash out and, and take some of that change, especially while they still have a big portion of their um, stock on hand. Finally, another complaint that they brought in the article was, on top of that, one of the biggest investors in Palantir is ARK Innovation, which in the future could have problems with liquidity due to its large positions in illiquid stocks. As a result, ARK might be forced to sell stocks like Palantir in order to keep afloat, which in the end will bring Palantir lower from the current levels. So ARK really hasn't had any issues with liquidity. I know there were like murmurings around on the internet, especially a couple of weeks ago when stock prices dipped because most of the stuff that ARK's invested in is very like revolutionary, very disruptive, and therefore mostly quite tech heavy too, which sold off the hardest. So people were like, oh my gosh, ARK's gonna be in trouble. ARK's gonna get screwed when everybody pulls their money out. But actually what ended up happening is that Kathy would address this in her program in the know uh, a couple weeks ago she said first of all the traditional ways of valuing stocks are going to become less and less relevant so if you have algorithms that are doing your buying and selling and you plug in the pe ratio and you plug in all these different factors and then it just buys and sells stuff for you those aren't going to work with companies like this and tesla is an example of that how tesla's stock price has gone crazy despite 
you know, a very different price to sales ratio than most other automakers. And we're also seeing Tesla continue to power forward, building different factories in Germany and Texas, and I think India coming up and stuff like that. They're going to be continuing their growth and continuing innovation and continuing the world's change to EVs. And then secondarily, Kathy Wood in that address said, um, we might have to sell out of our lower conviction stocks during a massive dip. And I think they did cut their positions in a few of their stocks. But she said, what we do when stock, when prices are down is that we buy in more heavily to our higher conviction stocks. And so this author is saying they might sell out of Palantir, but actually what ended up happening is that ARK across their various funds ended up grabbing more than 6 million shares of Palantir. That's like some pretty high conviction. So taking a step back, um, this article isn't very well researched or very well written. The, is there some motivation for them to get the stock price lower, to get people out of Palantir? Do they want to pick it up for cheaper? We've seen cases like that before. Um, what do you guys think? Let me know down in the comment section. Also, let me know if you're interested in Palantir, if you're uncomfortable with Palantir, if you're in it for the long haul. I'm in it for the long haul. I love it, and I'm excited to see how it's going to be changing the world. Thank you guys very much for your time. Love you, and talk to you soon.